All right, hello, hello. Come grab a seat, come grab a seat. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can you, can you, you got your present? Oh, it's Mr. Brody here. <laughs> Oh, so, sorry, Carl. Just quiet up the back, thanks. No. All right, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to Night Church. If I haven't met you yet, I'm Dom. If I have met you yet, I'm still Dom. Uh, but I'd love to meet you tonight if I haven't, so please come up afterwards and chat to me. Um, Welcome this week as we gather together as God's people once again, uh, continuing our series of Our God Who. Uh, tonight, Ian's going to be taking us through the Bible a bit later. We're looking at Our God Who Raises. Uh, so last week, if you were here or you forgot, um, Dan took us through our God who atones, and we looked at uh, how God, uh, our, our God brings us back uh, to be in relationship with him. Um, but I might just pray quickly to kick us off uh, before we get started. So please bow your heads with me. Uh, dear Lord, uh, we thank you that we can gather tonight as your people. Uh, we pray that whatever happened this week, whether it was a great week, an awful week, somewhere in between, that we can put that aside and gather together as your people. Are we sorry for the ways in this week in which we've uh, rebelled against you um, and we ask for your forgiveness. I pray that now you help us to settle down, uh, to listen up and to learn what Ian has to preach for, um, to us tonight. Amen. Amen. All right, uh, before we get into our first song, uh, last week I read Mark 15 uh, is what Dan took us through, uh, Jesus on the cross. So I thought tonight might be fitting if I kick us off with a little bit of, from Mark 16, uh, when afterwards, when Jesus rose again. So I'll read for us. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who will roll the, st roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him, but go, tell his disciples and Peter. He's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. If you would please stand, we'll go through our first song. Let's sing of God's amazing grace. Life and joy, my chains 
Hello, I'm Nicola, for those who haven't met me, and I am going to be leading us in prayer tonight, so please bow your heads and pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for being the God over all things, for the plans you had from creation since the beginning of time and their fulfilment in Christ Jesus. We want to humble ourselves before you tonight as we acknowledge our sinfulness and to look to your Son, whose death and resurrection has taken us from death to life. May we be reminded that it is by your grace alone that we have been saved. Because of this, Lord, we want to thank you uh, for those within this church who have raised up to um, serve. We thank you that you have blessed us so abundantly with leaders who seek to train and mentor, creating leaders for generations to come for the sole purpose to let your name be known. We want to take this time to bring before you those serving within MTS, Tim, Alex, Sam and Ben. Thank you, Lord, for the people you have raised them to be, for placing on their hearts a deep desire to serve you by serving your people and your church. Thank you for the blessing that Tim and Alec are here at EAC as they serve us here at Night Church as well as with youth and kids. And we celebrate the joy it is to send Ben and Sam to reach those within the universities at a time when people are often seeking purpose and meaning and pray for the new communities which they are now a part of. For each of them, Lord, we pray for a continual reliance on your power and wisdom to guide and support them. We pray that those around them continue to point them to Jesus as their true teacher and that your spirit continues to work in their hearts, making them more like Jesus every day. Lord, we also want to thank you for Jeremy and Felicity and the blessing that they have been to our congregation here at EAC. We ask, Lord, that you continue to guide them each day in their role as parents, students and your disciples. Be with Jeremy, Lord, as he continues his studies at college, drinking in your word and learning well. May they continue to look to you for the plans you have for them into next year and beyond. As we think about leaders you have generously given us, we pray, Lord, that you continue to build your kingdom, guiding us as we continue to discuss the best way to reach out to 2233. We pray for generous givers, faithful prayers, and your wisdom, Lord, as we seek to add to the ministry team. We pray that you continue to help us love our neighbours well, always seeking the opportunity to share the good news of Jesus. We particularly pray for our brother Colin as he heads off to the U.S., Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful opportunity you have given him. We are all continually blessed and encouraged by him and the gift of music which you have lavished on him. We pray, Lord, that you create opportunities both now and into the future in the US whereby your son's name is made known through Colin's words and song. We pray his meetings are fruitful, that his song written, writing is spirit-filled and that you alone are glorified. 
and we pray for safety as he travels and a cup full to the brim on his return. Help us now to listen well and receive your word with soft hearts as we praise our living God. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. We're going to be singing about Jesus, our great cornerstone. Sorry. Anyway, um, while I'm tuning, um, I was away this weekend uh, <laughs> with Ben Warren and Cassandra. Um, on a camp called Trajectory uh, with Two Ways Ministries. Uh, think about how we live our whole lives for Jesus. That's in Cornerstone. Just in his righteousness 
Grab a seat, feature Kieran. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, good day to those at home as well. Uh, my name is Michael, uh, pastor here at Night Church. Uh, to point out uh, two things really quickly tonight, and then I'm going to interview a couple of people. Actually, I might get Cam and Beth to come up because I'm not going to take long doing point outs. Uh, if you've got your tear off slip, tear off your tear off slip, that's the first one. Uh, take a moment to fill that out. Everyone got a handout on the way in. Take a moment to fill that out. Uh, we'll collect that up in the final song tonight. Uh, especially if you're new or visiting, uh, we'd love to be able to say good day to you during the week. Uh, if you jot down a, a contact number or something like that, uh, then I'll get in touch and let you know a bit more about Engadine Anglican. Uh, while you're filling that out, just to let you know, coming up not next Saturday but the one after uh, is an HSC prayer breakfast that we're having here uh, with Dan and the Year 12s and anyone else who wants to come along. Uh, it'll be a chance to pray with and for our Year 12s uh, as they head into the HSC, uh, which is coming up remarkably soon. Sorry to stress you guys out, but I realise that's just a few weeks away. Anyway, I don't have to stress about those things anymore. Uh, so make sure you come along to that. Uh, 9.30, Saturday 10th, five bucks, free if you're in Year 12. Um, keep filling out your forms. We're going to hear from Cam and Beth. I'm going to move over, Marshall. I'm going to use this one. I think I'm walking off camera, but that doesn't matter. Uh, Cam, come on in. Yeah. Uh, Cam, you and Beth and a bunch of other people here at Night Church, uh, during the week you serve with uh, Anglican Youth Works. Mm -hmm. uh, Youth Works is a big organisation. Put your hand up if you serve with Anglican Youth Works. There's a bunch of you. There you go, there's a few floating around. Um, oh, there's one in the cry room. There you go. A uh, whole bunch of them. Uh, so we thought it would be good just to share with all of us a little bit about mm. what you guys do and how we can be supporting you. Cam, do you want to tell us particularly what you uh, and Beth as well do during the week? Yeah. What's your role? Um, like you said, YouthWorks is quite a big organisation. Um, we specifically work with YouthWorks COE, which stands for Christian Outdoor Education. Um, and we take uh, kids away on school camps, three to five day camps. Um, and we take them out on activities, uh, have a lot of fun. Um, this year we have about 15,000 kids. Uh, coming away on camps. Learnt uh, all their names? Uh, I, I, I don't know, 15... 90%? 90 maybe well maybe 15 <laughs> each camp on my little group and then yep. add that up, it's like 300 a term and then it keeps going. So, yeah. um, my short-term memory is better than my long-term. I don't, I don't remember <laughs> them much. Right anyway. Sorry, I interrupted. 15,000 kids? Yeah, 15,000 kids uh, <laughs> coming along this year um, and as, as well as doing activities, we get to um, share the gospel with them and sit down and do talks and lots of fun things. So, yeah. Awesome. Beth, do you want to share a little bit, what does the week look like for you in the midst of those 15,000? What do you do in camps and as the kids come along? And Yeah, um, so I'm going to talk through a bit of a day to day, what a day in the life of a youth works employee looks like. Um, we wake up bright and shining and, and excited for the day ahead. Um, we go to work and then we start by um, meeting together um, as the leaders and praying together and sharing how we're doing so we can care for each other throughout the day. Um, and then we, uh, when the groups are ready in, we go down and we um, do some uh, a Christian discovery session with them. So we get them to, to sit down and uh, one of our guides will um, present a talk to them about, you know, how much Jesus loves them. And, um, and then part of that, we split off um, and go to our small groups, so a guide and 15 kids. And then we just talk, you know, meet them where they're at, um, kind of discuss with them the the, the things that are going on in their life and um, how the Bible can, yeah, yeah, fit into their life as well and just tell them about how much Jesus loves them because that's so exciting. Um, and these are kids from all sorts of different schools, yeah. come from all over. Yeah. yeah. We have a school from Dubbo coming into the Blue Mountains this week. Um, so, yeah, just all around. It's a good yeah. time. Um, and then after that, we go into uh, three activities. So, you know, kind of whatever they choose, ab abseiling, canoeing, What's your archery. favourite? Um, my favourite is sailing. Nice. I'm not a sail guide yet, but my favourite thing to do is capsize a sailboat yeah, yeah. and then uncapsize it again. That's one of my favourite things to do at work. Anyway, nice. that's, yeah. Sorry, I got you distracted. Keep going. Uh, okay. Yeah, three activities. And then we kind of run through the activity and then at the end we sit down with them again, uh, talk them through their experiences, like abseiling. <gasps> oh, man, I was so scared at the start, but then it was fine. You know, that kind of thing. And then tell them, you know, bring Jesus into that again. It's so exciting. Um, and then we pack up for the day and head home and then come back joyful the next day. Do it all again. Uh, yeah. Do you want to share while you're there, uh, share with us a story of how you've seen God at work in the midst of all that. Um, have you seen the gospel going out and impacting kids? Yeah, I have lots of stories. Come and ask me more later. But um, I think one story that that really has encouraged me um, while I've been here is um, 
I had a group of a group of girls from uh, Covenant Christian School um, in Year Eight, um, and they were like that whole group were, were already solid Christian kids. Um, but they came and they were just so desperate to know how to share Jesus with the people around them. Um, and so we sat down and we we sang some Colin Buchanan songs. I don't normally bring that out, but that's what we did. Um, and then, well, sorry. We anyway. Whatever. Sorry, sorry Colin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Keep moving. Um, uh, uh, we sang some Colin Buchanan songs and we uh, kind of just talked uh, a little bit about um, that. Um, but then um, we got to we did an archery session in the mud. We had a dance party in the mud later, but I'll talk about that later. Um, but before that, we we sat down and I was like, all right, I don't normally do this with a group. Um, but I'm going to ask you this question and we'll see how it goes. And I'm like, if you're trying to describe the gospel through archery, how would you do it? And for immediately they're like, oh, 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 and I was like, yes, let's go. And they're like, oh, you know, we want to aim for Jesus. That's, you know, that's who we, who we want to you know, become um, and all that kind of thing. And I was like, oh, my goodness, you guys are evangelists already. You just need to open your mouth and say it. You know what's going on? Um, but then we kind of like, you know, spoke some more about, um, you know, the, the middle of the target thank you um, I swear I swear I'm good at my job um, I know I know what's going on anyway you tell who used to work there eh? love yeah, the bandit for it yeah, um, yeah embarrassing oh well um, in the middle of the target um, is you know perfection um, and how often do we get there pretty much never right um, we always fall short and we always um, we just like can never really get there we can't be we can't be perfect um, but uh, God's grace um, extends further than that um, it's not just to be perfect, to be with God, but he, um, with his grace, he opens that up um, for more people, for, for people that aren't perfect and can all uh, share in that glory um, and, yeah, share with, share with him and his family. Awesome. Cam, what's your, your favourite moment at YouthWorks? My favourite moment at YouthWorks? Um... Well, just tell us the story you were going to tell yeah, us. Well, <laughs> yeah, Sorry. No, th- this is probably my favourite moment yeah, yeah. at YouthWorks. Um, it was quite early when I started. I was only a new trainee um, and I uh, had some kids on group. I just had this one boy who just kept mucking up and kept doing the wrong thing. Uh, and it was a bit frustrating and uh, to the point where teachers even sat him out of an activity um, and he, he missed out on things. But he was able to come to Christian Discovery um, and hear more about God. And at the end of Christian Discovery, I normally ask the kids... Um, you know, if, if after hearing all this, uh, you have decided that you want to have a relationship with God, hang around with me after I pray and, and we can talk about what that looks like together. Uh, and this one boy who I thought, no way, he hasn't been listening the whole time, um, came up and said, oh, I want to be a Christian. Like, what do I have to do now? And I was just amazed and shocked. Um, I didn't think this kid was listening at all. Um, and so I sat down and I prayed with him and I showed him um, well, what the Bible says about uh, calling on Jesus' name and that um, whoever does that will be saved. Uh, and then I went and spoke to his teacher afterwards and she just was in the same uh, feeling that I was. She was absolutely shocked. She just ran up and gave me the biggest hug and I was just like, well, I'm new. Like, I don't really know. This, is, is this okay? Um, hopefully this is fine. Uh, but <laughs> uh, it was because she was rejoicing uh, that someone had come to know who Jesus was um, and we should rejoice in that. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, stay there. How can we be? Uh, how can we, as a church and, and as individuals, how can we be praying for you guys, encouraging you guys in your ministry week to week? Yeah, um, it's a it's a it's a busy job. It's full time ministry, um, and it is hard work. Um, but it's really rewarding and really great work um, that we get to do. Uh, and because of that, it does take a lot of energy. Um, and at the moment, we're a little bit down on staff, but. Um, uh, we're just asking for prayer that we can have more people join us, but also giving the staff their um, energy through uh, through God. So praying for energy for our staff would be really great um, because we're, we're tired and we're working hard, um, but with God's um, with God we can we can keep working, we can keep doing our job, and, and keep sharing. Yeah. Beth, how can we be praying for you, encouraging you? Uh, I think my favourite part of the ministry are the kids um, and. Like Cam said, we get so many kids in each week, um, let alone each term, let alone each year. Um, so I think just, yeah, prayer for the kids that come in. Um, pray that 
um, that they're, when they step away from their lives for the, for the few days that they're there, that they'll really open up their hearts and minds to, to hear of a God who loves them. Um, you know, even the people that, you know, come from a situation where they don't feel loved, um, that they can come in and they can feel God's love, um, that they can, uh, yeah, continue in that as they, as they leave. Um, and, yeah, just continue to share um, the joy that they have in the gospel as well. Awesome. Well, we're going to pray for you guys, and uh, then we're going to read the Bible together, so I'll pray for that as well. Uh, why don't we pray? Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the ministry of YouthWorks uh, over many generations now. Uh, thanks for these guys and the, uh, the others amongst us here at Night Church who serve you uh, yeah, day in, day out uh, at the campsites. Uh, Father, we thank you uh, for the privilege it is for them, uh, for so many thousands of kids to come through the doors each year uh, and have that little moment in their lives where they get to hear Jesus taught clearly from the Bible. Uh, we pray, Father, that you will continue to uh, to do your work, to build your kingdom as you uh, call uh, those children to um, come and put their trust in Jesus. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you will be saving many, that you'll be uh, planting seeds that grow into the future uh, as you continue to raise up uh, people for your son and his glory. Uh, Father, as we read your word together now, we pray that we will be strengthened, that we will be encouraged, that we will press on uh, in, in hope uh, of what is to come on that glorious day when Christ returns. Uh, and we pray that you help us to listen well uh, and to focus in as you speak. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys. Uh, grab your Bible. Nick is going to come and read 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is where we're reading from. Uh, and then Ian's going to come and preach. Thanks, Nick. No worries. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 23. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was in me, that was with me. Whether, then, it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him.
Thanks, Nick. G'day, everybody. How about you take a minute or two to be able to say g'day to the people around you and welcome them to church. Go for it. everyone I'll call you back together it's good to hear so many conversations thanks Marshall for making me feel shorter also by bringing the microphone even lower I appreciate that um, all right friends uh, please keep 1 Corinthians chapter 15 open in front of you uh, it's going to be really helpful going through and there's an outline obviously uh, in your outlines given to you please take some notes if that's helpful and if you've got any questions please write them down we'd love to go through them at the end <clears throat> Friends, have you ever had that moment in your life where you've said, is this all that there is? Let me tell you about a guy named Marcus Pearson. Now, Marcus invented and developed Minecraft. Uh, you might know of him. Eventually, at the age of 36, he sold it for $2.5 billion dollars. And then a couple of years, he bought himself an island, apparently. <laughs> like, you know, that's what you do with that much money. Um, a couple of years later, he was hanging out in Ibiza, and this is what he tweeted. He said this, Hanging out in Ibiza with a bunch of friends and partying with famous people, able to do whatever I want, and I've never felt more isolated. Is this all that there is? I don't know what it is for you. Maybe it could be, you know, you've been longing for that holiday for so long. And you get there and it rains for the entire time and you feel frustrated and, and it was disappointing. And you ask yourself, is this all that there is? It could have been something that has happened in your life where things have just fallen apart. When it's difficult and disappointing, you ask the question, is this all that there is? You might be getting older or have a disability or have a chronic illness. You might have lost a loved one. You might lament in your life and say to yourself, this is not fair, and ask, is this all that there is? So often we look for a whole bunch of things to fill that void, don't we, and, and answer that question. It could be for some, it could be a child, it could be a relationship, it could be the right job or, or the holiday or, or retirement or, or success or... But none of those things still satisfy, and the question is still there. Is this all that there is? The writer of Ecclesiastes, a book in the Old Testament, in some ways comes to the same conclusions as he looks around the world that is around him. This is what he says in chapter 1. It's on the screen, verse 3. What do people gain from all their labours at which they toil under the sun? Then verse 9. What has been will be again. And what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? It was here already a long time ago. It was here before our time. No one remembers the former generations and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. Um, years ago, when we first got married, I used to live in Sutherland with Megan. Uh, and one of the most beautiful places to be able to go for a walk was around Warrenora Cemetery. It was quiet, funnily enough. Um, but you know what? When you walk past some of the graves that are there, big old graves, the writing of who is on the grave has been worn away so that you don't even know who is buried there. And there are people in, that are alive today that wouldn't even know that they're a relative of somebody who is in that cemetery. Verse 11 no one remembers the former generations and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. The writer of Ecclesiastes, he asks the same question. Is that all there is? Has anything happened in history that is new? Can anything answer the question, is this all that there is? And he asks that question because of the one certainty that we all face, no matter age or class or race or wealth or ability or the one certainty that is to come is death. The resurrection of Jesus brings a definitive answer 
to those questions. Has anything happened in history that is new? Yes. Is this all that there is? No, there is something more. Friends, the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. And today we're going to look at our God who raises. Because the resurrection is perhaps the most exciting thing to be able to talk about as a Christian. It brings excitement and anticipation into the future that I can think of like no other topic that there is. It is life-changing. And we're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 today. It'll be really helpful. Perhaps it'd be helpful if you'd like to go home and read the entire chapter. Can I encourage you to do that? It's a letter, 1 Corinthians is a letter that Paul wrote to a church that was largely immature and uninformed. And one of the topics that Paul covered at the end of the letter was the resurrection. And it will be super helpful for us as we think through our God who raises. So point number one, Jesus' resurrection is important. Well, as we start, what is the Bible talking about when it talks about resurrection? Resurrection refers to the physical raising of a person back to life after they have died. It's not a Hollywood kind of movie soul drifting up away from the body idea or a a zombie apocalypse kind of idea or anything like that. It's not reincarnation coming back as something else. No, when we talk about the resurrection, when the Bible talks about the resurrection, it talks about the physical body being raised up, being made alive once more. And that's why Jesus' resurrection is so important. We celebrate this at Easter, don't we? But we also celebrate it each and every week as we come to church, that Jesus' body was laid in the tomb after he died on the cross. And then on the third day, he was raised again. He came back to life. He walked and talked and was with people who were around him. See, friends, the idea of resurrection is central to the good news about Jesus. And that's exactly the point that Paul makes in verses 3 to 8 of 1 Corinthians 15. Have a look at it in front of you. It's going to be really helpful to follow along. 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 3. Paul says, For what I received I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared also to me as to one abnormally born. What's important in this passage? What are the verbs? What are the, the important words that are coming out? Well, Jesus died for our sins, according to the scriptures. Tremendous truth that we spent all of last week looking at as we look about the God who atones, who brings us into relationship with himself. But Paul doesn't just say that Jesus died. No, there's more, isn't there? Paul says the important good news is that Jesus died, but that he was also buried and then raised, and more so, he appeared to many. Jesus died, was buried, was raised, but also He appeared, and that comes up four times. He appeared, he appeared, he appeared, he appeared. Jesus' resurrection, it was a real historical event. That's why he wrote the letter. When he wrote the letter, Paul said that there there are many people who are still alive who, who saw him. You can go and have a chat to one of them and find out what it was like if you really wanted to. Go and talk to them. You see, friends, the cross reminds us that Jesus was God who became man in amazing humility. God became man to die for us. And the cross shows us that, well, God's grace meant that Jesus would bear our sin and he would bring us complete forgiveness. But the cross is only one half of the coin, isn't it? The resurrection is the other half, and it is very, very exciting, friends. It's exciting because Jesus' resurrection shows Jesus' victory over sin and death. It's exciting because Jesus' resurrection vindicates Jesus. He was who he said he was, and he could do what he said he could do. He didn't deserve death, and so he rose again. And it's exciting because Jesus' resurrection also shows that the payment that Jesus made for you and I for our sin was full and complete. But it also shows us that he is now alive. He was raised never to die again. And because of that, he rules now and he will bring acceptance and forgiveness to all who come and put their trust in Jesus. 
Friends, it is amazing and wonderful news that Jesus rose. But can you see how it is incredibly uncomfortable news in our culture to say that we believe in the resurrection of the dead? In fact, talking about death and what happens next, it just kills conversation. When years and years ago, when I was working as an architect, we had uh, morning tea at 10.30 on the dot every day. And one day I brought up the topic of death at morning tea. Try that. (laughs) It's a way to kill a conversation. It was just, it was kind of beautifully awkward. (laughs) Like people were like, oh, I'm going to look down. I'm not going to look at anybody. Uh, We ended up talking for a little bit. Um, Everybody volunteered to do the washing up because they just wanted to get out of the room. Anyway, one guy was like, yeah, I I found a dead body when I was holidaying in Brazil. It was really, really weird and confronting. But death is a massive taboo to be able to talk about in our society, isn't it? We say in the Apostles' Creed at church, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Now, I want you to think for a second. If we didn't believe in the resurrection, what would happen? What would happen if we didn't believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Friends, that's our second point, and Paul is pretty clear. No resurrection, no hope. No resurrection, no hope. Have a look, starting at verse 12, 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins." then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Friends, Christianity without the resurrection is like a car without an engine, like a pool without water or like a nappy bag without nappies. It is just useless. You see, Paul's point is that if death is the end and there is no resurrection, then not even Jesus was raised. That means that our sin was not paid for and we still stand guilty having to face our own judgment. If Jesus wasn't resurrected, then, well, he was a liar and we are following a lie. Have a look at verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. If Jesus wasn't resurrected, then very bluntly, go home. What we are doing here is useless. Christians are therefore a hopeless and a sad bunch. If Jesus wasn't resurrected, then well, what about me? What about you? I gave up my job as an architect to tell people about a guy who was rotting away in a grave somewhere in Israel. Paul's right. If Jesus is dead, when, what am I doing here? What are we doing here? What I've based my life on is useless. What we have based our lives on is useless. Actually, we should be laughed at and pitied if that is the case, if Jesus wasn't raised. But friends, can I just say that it wouldn't just be Christianity that would be pointless. Life would be without hope. Remember the author of Ecclesiastes, meaningless, meaningless, vanity, vanities. We would work hard each day, day in and day out, for nothing, because in the end, we're still going to die. We would chase after more and more money for security and the comfort and the enjoyment that it gives, but money can't save you from death. Do you know what I noticed when I was walking around Warrenora Cemetery? Or what I didn't notice? I didn't notice garages at the back of graves. Can't take it with you, can you? Friends, we chase fitness. But health is going to fail us one day, whether we like it or not. We chase after relationships, be it with others, be it with family or be it with loved ones. But the reality is if death is the end, then relationships also end. Friends, if Jesus wasn't resurrected, our faith is futile and we are still in our sins and we are lost. God is still in control, but my sin is painfully real and I need to face judgment for my sin from God. It's a pretty hopeless and flat end. 
if there is no resurrection of the dead. I just want to feel the weight of that for a minute. No resurrection. No hope. I want you to think about the complete hopelessness that those women felt as they walked to the tomb where Jesus was laid on that third day. Their friend was lost, dead. They didn't expect anything else. In fact, the three women were expecting to find a dead body, lifeless in a tomb, and they were expecting to go there and weep. But friends, that wasn't what they found, was it? Friends, the good news is that Jesus wasn't there. He had risen from the dead. Jesus was resurrected. He came back to life. And that's exactly the hope and the joy that Paul expresses in verses 20 to 23. Have a look at it. Verses 20 to 23. Point number three, Jesus is raised and therefore we have hope. Let me read to you from verse 20. Paul says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Paul says that if Jesus wasn't raised, there is no hope. But the most momentous and kind of joyous, amazingly incredible news that we have is that Jesus is resurrected. Because Jesus is raised, there is hope for us in the face of death. Death is not the end. There is purpose and meaning right now as we live our lives. We have hope in this life because as we know that Jesus was raised, firstly, we know that, well, that's God showing his approval of what Jesus did on the cross for us. We stand forgiven completely and right with God because of the victory that Jesus won for us over sin. As a young teenager, a mate of mine who in great irony is now a lieutenant colonel in the army in intelligence, um, he got his hands on a box of bungers and that was great fun. Now in our genius creativity and our great intelligence, we decided to sticky tape them to golf balls. And then one person would light the fuse of the bunger and the other person would swing the golf club very quickly in hope that this ball would go flying up into the air and then midair explode up over the water. It didn't happen that way, unfortunately. It turns out that firecrackers, little firecrackers, aren't meant to withstand the kind of blunt force of a golf club hitting them. Um, and when you do, the kind of powder of the bunger went everywhere and kind of ignited really, really quickly. And it turns out also that that wasn't the most foolish thing that we did at the same time. Um, the most foolish thing that we did was trying to do that while my parents were at home <laughs> at the same time. And as so things were going bang, it was, well, obviously not a good idea. Needless to say that it didn't end well. Now, this didn't happen, but I want you to imagine that it did happen. And my brother was, I don't know, upstairs studying algebra or Shakespeare or something like that. Um, imagine then he came down, and even though he was completely innocent, imagine he came down and he took the blame for my mate and myself. My mum and dad know that he is innocent and didn't deserve any of the judgment in that way, but they say that, sure, he will pay for your sin by staying in his room, and we will get forgiveness. Now, as long as he stays there in his room with the door closed, stuck, we know that that punishment still stands, don't we? It is there, justice is being served. But when the door opens and my brother walks out, well, then justice has been paid. And as he walks free, I know that I am free from that. Friends, Jesus has been raised he has triumphed over sin and death, and therefore your sin is completely dealt with. And Paul says that because he has been raised, we too will be raised. Verse 20, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, if you're a farmer, I'm not, <laughs> um, you long for a brilliant first fruits of the crop, don't you? It's the sign of what is to come. If the first fruits of the crop is good, then the rest will be good. If the first fruits is bad, well, then that shows an ominous sign of what is to come. Jesus' resurrection shows that we too will be resurrected. 
one day in the future when he returns. We will rise again. Jesus was raised and therefore we too will be raised. Jesus first and in the future, we too will be raised. Friends, the resurrection, it has implications, not just for for Christians, but for everyone. It shows us who Jesus really is and it shows us what he will do in the future. In a speech that Paul said to a bunch of people uh, at the Areopagus in Athens, uh, he said this in Acts chapter 17, verse 31, speaking about God, for he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. That's Jesus. He has given proof of this to everybody by raising him from the dead. Friends, the resurrection proves that Jesus is the God who made everything and also the God who calls everything to account. And one day in the future, we will see Jesus for who he really is. And on that day, Jesus will judge. And on that day, everybody who puts their trust, their faith, their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, they will stand forgiven and free, victorious with him forever. That means that death isn't the end. That means that there is more to life. Life is just a warm-up because the main event is coming when when everyone will be raised, either to live forever knowing Jesus has paid for their judgment and celebrating and rejoicing in what Jesus has done, or to live forever realising that they will take their own judgment upon their shoulders because they chose to ignore God's great King, the Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, please make sure that you hear this. That is what is so exciting about Jesus' resurrection. Jesus' resurrection brings the dawn of a new age where sin is forgiven and we have certainty in that and where death is not the end. Therefore, friends, if death is not the end, if you follow Jesus, you need not fear death for it no longer reigns. So what Paul says at the very end of chapter 15. Have a look at chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Have a look at verse 54. Paul says, Because of Jesus' victory, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I heard a story once, and I think it is too good to too good to not share. A father and a son they were driving along, and the father's the window was down in the car. And as they were driving along, a bee came into the car. Now the son started to freak out because there was this bee flying around in the car, flying around his face, flying around his head. And suddenly the dad reached out and he grabbed the bee in his hand. He held it, and the bee stung him on the hand. And when he did, its stinger came out. When it happened, the dad let it go and the bee started to continue to fly around the car in front of him. Now, the son was still afraid, still freaked out about what was happening in front of him, but then the dad stopped the car and he pointed to his hand and he said, ha, I have taken the sting. You need not fear the bee anymore. It has no power over you. It cannot hurt you. Friends, Jesus has taken death's sting and he has triumphed. We know that even though we will face death, it isn't the end. Jesus' resurrection is the victory that declares that Jesus rules and he also offers forgiveness and eternal life to all those who come to him. I remember Dan saying last week that the death of Jesus changes everything. Well, in the same way, Perhaps even more so, the resurrection of Jesus changes everything because it also changes our lives right here and now. It brings amazing excitement and anticipation and also hope. Friends, it goes without saying, but firstly, if you are not sure about where you stand with Jesus, if you are not sure 100% with absolute certainty where you will stand when you come and stand before the Lord Jesus then please don't leave here today without getting that clarity. Talk to the person next to you who brought you along. Come and have a chat to anybody around the place. We would love to talk to you about the Lord Jesus and what he has accomplished. Let's figure that out together and figure out 
how Jesus' death and his resurrection gets rid of the fear that death gives to us. Figure out how he gives you forgiveness and hope of the future. But friends, if you are a follower of Jesus here, I hope you rejoice in the hope and the certainty that the resurrection gives you. It gives us the hope of the fact that, well, in the face of the common experience that we all face death, we have joy despite the pain that will be before us. We don't think about death very much, do we? As I go about my life in Heathcote each and every day, as I walk the dog, I'm not confronted with death. It's not in my face, but then that event happens that brings it very quickly on the radar, whether it be the diagnosis or the funeral or the hospital trip that brings back memories. I walked out of the office just next door about a month and a half ago to do a funeral here and I suddenly had the realisation that because of events completely out of my control, I could only be a week and a half out from my own funeral. And that is the same for each and every person in this room. Now, our church building doesn't very much remind us of death, does it? But when I did church at one of the buildings in Dapto, the 8am church uh, at St Luke's Brownsville, it was a very real reminder. You walked right next to the cemetery to get to the front door of the church. Death was a very real reminder to you. Friends, how does the resurrection of Jesus and how does our future resurrection, how does that give us hope? How does knowing the resurrection of Jesus, how does that take away our fear of death? Now, let me put yourself, myself in the shoes of perhaps different people uh, in our congregation here today. You might be mourning the death of somebody close to you who knew Jesus. And if you have not yet experienced that, then you will. It's inevitability that will happen in life. But know that for those who die trusting in the Lord Jesus, the resurrection enables both grief and hope to coexist for those mourning, those who are lost. We will now mourn and we will grieve the brokenness and the hurt of death and miss the relationship and miss the touch of that person and But we also need to remember the future, don't we? We also need to remember the resurrection and know that death is not the end. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, it's on the screen, says this, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. And Jesus says himself in John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. I remember uh, just under six years ago, standing at the grave of one of my closest friends who I went through college with. He died in 2016 from leukaemia. I shared a study with him. I went to and from college with him each and every day. I played tennis with him down at the courts at Summer Hill. I did life with him and his family, his wife and his four kids. At his funeral, I went to give his wife a big hug and I was a blubbering mess. Simone said to me at that day, Jesus has risen, Ian. Dan will too. She said that to me at her husband's funeral. Friends, if you mourn the death of a loved one who died trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, friends, please take comfort from the promises of the Lord Jesus. The resurrection will come when Jesus comes. And so as Christians, we should long for that day, should we not? But you might not be mourning the death of a loved one. You might be mourning or afraid of the very real possibility of death. You might have got a recent diagnosis that worries you or your family. Your pain that you go through every day might be immense and perhaps there is no end to the tears or the the feeling of uncertainty that you have. You might be feeling your frailty 
Or perhaps in your life, you're just not feeling the denial anymore and know that death will come at some point in time. Friends, take heart. The Lord Jesus is in control and he is for you. Please hear this, no matter what happens to you in the midst of that struggle, your resurrection and your future life with Jesus is a certainty because he is raised. And if you trust in him, he will never leave you or forsake you and that even means in death. And you have certainty of the resurrection to look forward to an eternity with Jesus where you'll be raised and there'll be no more tears or crying or pain and you'll be with the Lord Jesus for eternity. All those who have their faith in him will also be there. Friends, you might be here and you might not be worried about that at all. You might be young and fit and healthy And the world might be at your feet. You might be able-bodied. You might be enthusiastic. You might have plans about what is going to happen in the next couple of years. It feels like a short time ago I was finishing high school and I have a child who in a year and a half time is about to enter high school. That is a strange thought. Friends, can I encourage you to not live in light of the next one to two to five to even 10 to 20 years of your future? But live in light of the resurrection and in light of your eternal future as you have your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says this at the very end of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In light of the resurrection, in light of the fact that Jesus is victorious, and in light of the fact that he rules and he forgives and that he is coming back, he says this, 1 Corinthians 15 verse 58, it's on the screen. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. The writer of Ecclesiastes, he looked for hope and he looked for it in joy and he looked for it in wealth and he looked for it in pleasure and he looked for it in wisdom and, and he just couldn't find it because as far as he knew, from what he could see in front of him, death was the end. But death isn't the end. Jesus' resurrection and therefore our resurrection in the future on that day that is coming means that we have purpose in the here and now. Our labour in the Lord, whatever that might be, is not in vain because it is his kingdom and not our kingdom that lasts for eternity. I may have shared this illustration with you before, but when I was working as an architect, um, the firm that I was working in, the project that I got, we got paid a million dollars, the 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 client was willing to pay a million dollars to be able to have a pool, a garage, a fence, a driveway and some landscaping work. A million dollars. Do you know what? In 30 years time, that pool is not going to be standing. That fence will have fallen down and that driveway will have been worn out. Friends, our labour in the Lord, whatever that might be, is not in vain because it is his kingdom and not our kingdom that will last for eternity. Friends, if that is the case, then why not use your youth, your vigour, your energy, your excitement, your retirement to be able to give yourselves to his work, knowing that the resurrection is coming and knowing that therefore making sure that people stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ is so important. Friends, take comfort and also perhaps take challenge from Jesus' words. And I'm going to finish by reading from John chapter 11 again. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And you see how Jesus has finished that? Do you believe this? How will your life be different living in light of the resurrection? How about I pray, hey? Father God, we thank you that you died for us. We thank you that the Lord Jesus took our sin upon his shoulders to pay 
for our sin and our death. Father, we thank you also that that was not the end. We thank you that Jesus rose again from the dead. We thank you that he rose, that he is alive now, that he rules and he reigns, and we thank you that he is coming back. Father, thank you for the great certainty of the resurrection that that gives for those who are in Christ. Father, we ask that we would take comfort from that in hurt. We ask that we would take great joy and anticipation in looking forward to that day. And Father, we ask that you would take us and that you would use us for your kingdom. Father, please help us live in light of eternity, in light of the resurrection and in light of your return. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Tyler's a shocker tonight.
I forgot to mention earlier, um, to get your connect slips ready for Tim, so if you have a connect slip you need, hand it in, find Dodsey, find me, I'll make sure he gets it. You're the right Put person? The Put in the collection box, there you go. Don't talk to Dodsey, he doesn't want to talk. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, and one other important piece of notice, um, I forgot to mention the start, um, some of you may have noticed uh, Tim Griffiths proudly sporting a Bonnet Bay jacket, uh, so please make sure you go and congratulate him on his grand final win today afterwards. <laughs> All right, now the serious bit. Uh, Ian asked us tonight, is this all there is? The answer is no, Jesus has risen. And we also saw that death is inevitable for all of us. But as Christ has risen, so we too will be raised. And we can be certain of this. Then we'll be able to say, 
Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? Let's keep chatting about that now, and we'll see you next week.